I think the last experience I had was probably when I graduated college um, back in 2019. I was seeing orbs like come around me. I would smell my dad's cologne as gentlemen wow. would fly me. You know, so that kind of gave me the sense that he was there. He saw me graduate. He saw me walk across that stage and seeing what I have accomplished of my Aww. life since the passing. Hi everyone, this is Diane Gilman, formerly the Queen of Jeans, but now the host of my own podcast titled Too Young to Be Old. So I'm going to ask you, for anybody over the age of 30, have you lost, and you probably have, someone you really loved, someone who was foundational to your life, someone who you would miss forever? And as the shadows grow longer and the nights grow darker and we're coming up to Thanksgiving. You probably have had a lot of Thanksgiving sitting around that family table and talking about the loved ones who are no longer there. Well, that is the theme of today's podcast. It's all part of a paranormal series that has gone through October and now into November. And it is about getting a second chance to say that final goodbye. And without further ado, I am going to tell my story after we meet and hear the story from a friend of mine, Mary Rivera. Our encounters with the most loved person in our life who passed on are radically different, but both had the same effect, that we were touched and contacted by the spirit world. So without further ado, I want to introduce Mary Rivera. And Mary, I want you to tell your story the way you told it to me. It was heartbreaking, and at the same time, it was so life-affirming. So. Mary is going to tell us the story of who she lost, how that person was lost, and how that person came back. Go for it, my friend. Thank you so very much, Diane, for having me on today. I'm I'm really honored to be part of this today. Um, So my story starts the morning of my 13th birthday. Um, I lost my father in the prime years of my time. So the story goes, my father had a medical issue dating back years prior to his death. And the morning of my 13th birthday, I found him deceased um, in his bed. And I was the first one to find him and took that very, 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 very hard. Um, My father was a teacher. And so his routine in the morning was to make sure to wake me up make sure I got in the shower and then he would be downstairs making breakfast prior to us going to school. Um, That particular morning that did not happen, um, which was really strange. I woke up and when I realized he did not come wake me up, I went into his room, finding him still laying in his bed, not thinking anything of it again, being 13 years of age. Um, So I was like, dad, you know, got to get up. We're going to be running late. Went and jumped in the shower, expecting to, once I get out of the shower, to smell breakfast coming from downstairs, which I did not. Um, Again, being 13, you don't think anything of it. Go back into his room, find him still laying in his bed, um, shaking his shoulders. I'm like, Dad, you need to get up. You need to get up. We're going to be late. No response. I went into my mother's room to let her know he wasn't waking up, where she knew she had a sixth sense that he was gone. Um, how she knew, I don't know. So I go downstairs, I call for the police department to come out and they do. Um, the mortuary shows up, they take his body out of the house. Took it very, 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 very hard. I was a big, big, big daddy's girl. Um, so I went through a really dark time in my life where I wasn't, I wasn't eating. I was 
cutting on my wrist and just doing whatever I could to try to get back to my father. Cause I'm like, well, he's gone. There's no, you know, no purpose, no reason for me to stay here. So I was able to go through and get the, the funeral was complete and everything like that. And I had a lot of support behind me, my youth group at the church, um, my school, since I was attending a private boarding school, they were really, you know, flexible with allowing me to stay home. My professors would bring over my books and I would be able to complete my studies. I went to my best friend's house at the time about two weeks after all this had happened. And we were in her room just doing whatever, whether we were watching a movie. I don't remember exactly what we were doing at the time, but um, we were in her room and in the middle of the night, the whole entire room lights up like times a thousand that you would normally see um come to find out it was my father coming into the room and it wasn't just me that saw him it was her that saw him as well and it was the full full body apparition it was everything his sweatshirt his coaching sweatshirt that we uh buried him in everything stating to me he was okay he saw what i was going through and said you know there's no reason for you to feel guilty i'm okay you're okay. You need to go on and live your life as a normal teenager as best as you can. He was like, but I'm okay. You need to know that. And that pretty much, you know, I had told mom, like, how do you want me to go on? You were my life. You were my world. You were everything. How do you want me to go on? He was like, you have so much going for you. You need to continue going on. And then as quickly as everything started is as quickly as it ended and that was the best you know the best experience that i had just because it was reassuring knowing he was okay i didn't need to blame myself that there was nothing that i could have done to try to change him not being in the physical world anymore was was he solid he was. was he in color he was yeah so it wasn't multiple gray apparition it was no 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 no. it was as if he was physically standing in front of me and was there was the room totally dark when this happened it was yes and and were you guys talking about him or this just no we were came it out just, of nowhere it came out of nowhere we were watching i'm almost certain we were watching a movie um it you know how they had categorize it back in the day when you're a kid i went to have a slumber party i went to have a sleepover yeah. and yeah. so we were just you know doing us having you know junk foods uh, popcorn snacks stuff like that watching a movie um all the lights were off other than the tv and then he just came out of nowhere and when he spoke to you mary and i only ask you this from a couple of experiences i had with my rock, my my entire world who passed away. Um, and I will tell that story shortly. But for he never spoke, but I got ideas of what he was doing through my mind. It was like your lips didn't move, but it was a mind to mind contact. How how was he so natural? that he it was just like he was talking it was oh yeah absolutely like i said it was it was as if he was literally physically in person in front of me but obviously that wasn't possible because he had passed a couple weeks prior so but it it was full like like i said his his beard his glasses his big structured body his sweatshirt his coaching sweatshirt the whole nine yards. It it was completely as if it was natural. And how how long do you think that lasted? I mean, I know it's hard to quantify time, but I would say a few minutes at least. It wasn't wow. it was a quick, you know, one one and a half minutes where it's in and out. He it was a few minutes. And what did your friend think of this? I mean, she must have been slightly freaked out. She was, however, she was very spiritual. So she was very open to receiving that and that she witnessed the same exact thing that I did. So it was nice knowing that it wasn't just me that saw him, that I did have a witness alongside me and that she was completely open and was like, 
this actually happened. She was like, see, Mary, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. So did you feel elevated afterwards? Did you feel inspired? Did you feel infused with something extraordinary? What was your feeling afterwards? And how did this change your life going forward? I was very relieved um, knowing that he was okay, that I didn't need to continue to blame myself. Um, I always had that what if, what if, what if in the back of my mind, even though on the day that they came and collected his body from the house, they said he had passed hours to you finding him. He was like, there was nothing that you could have done. But I continued to blame myself, thinking that there was something I could have done to change the circumstance. So when he did come to me and say he was okay, that was very relieving, knowing that I could go on with my life. Yes, it was going to be tough, and it still is on some days, but it was comforting knowing that it was okay. You know, I've um, I, I've had encounters. Most of them have been in my sleep, but nobody was ever really solid. Or, uh, and I actually have never, ever heard a story like this where someone you loved manifested themselves so dramatically while you were awake. And so the two of you, you and your friend, mm -hmm. must have been very open to this. And I ask you this question. You know, to me, it's almost a talent that you allow the spirit world to contact you. Mm -hmm. And because you have to sort of relax and open yourself up. Has it happened to you in any form manifested itself since then or no? Um, not recent, no, but in the years after. He's been deceased now for 20 years. Um, so it did for a few years after, but not really since. Um, I think the last experience I had was probably when I graduated college. Um, back in 2019, I was seeing orbs like come around me. I would smell my dad's cologne as gentlemen wow. would find me. You know, so that kind of gave me the sense that he was there. He saw me graduate. He saw me walk across that stage and seen what I have accomplished of my uh, life since the passing. But beyond uh, that, I've not, wow. I have not had any manifestations, no. But that's still sort of strong. And when you saw him and you got that additional chance, that final chance to say, thank you for coming to me and, and I'm going to do better. Um, did a depression lift from you? Was, was that to me the purpose of the manifestation? He was worried about you. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make things right. And was there a dramatic change in your mood level or the way you started encountering people and events in life after that? Yes. Um, so previous to all this happening, um, I spent a lot of time in my room um, just crying and, and saying to myself, I wouldn't go downstairs and eat. I wouldn't go to school. Um, after this occurrence, I went to a Christian concert. Fernando Ortega was his name. and my mother had said, well, you can sponsor a child, but you have to start going back to school. And since I had that opportunity to see my father, that helped. I ended up going back to school. I was able to get myself caught up and get back, you know, into what I needed to do, knowing that I now have that peace of mind. He's okay. You know, that he's not just stuck here. He, that he's okay. That is absolutely phenomenal and um i think also there was something you mentioned to me and if you don't mind i'm going to share it with the audience that he meant so much to you because you were an adopted child yes so yes so here you are and you're chosen by this husband and wife to share your life with them and have them help you and be foundational and actually it probably meant even more to you than if you just, you know, you're born into a family and 
you take it for granted mm -hmm. that you're part of this family and but but no when you're an adopted child you're chosen and look how lucky you were that you were chosen by two people who you absolutely grew to love so unconditionally and get that in return um something i sort of never had from a natural family so i i look at your experience and think just what a spectacular comeback to tragedy and boy do i wish somebody could have come back to me that i lost and said i'm okay you're okay let's get on with it so yeah. i am going to thank you and ask you to stick around in here now i'm going to tell my story with somebody who meant everything to me who i lost and then at the end we'll just discuss it for a few moments and and um we'll say our goodbyes so to the audience um because i was on teleretailing for 30 years none of these stories were anything i was ever going to be able to tell on hsn qbc and uh nor would it have been appropriate but when I was 52 years old, I'm 78 now, so 26 years ago, I lost the man I lived with for 20 years. And I had come out of a very broken, uh, very chaotic household and home life. And I was definitely a damaged human being. And Jim, Jim Rush, put me back together again. He was everything to me. He was my rock. He was my foundation. And he was my greatest cheerleader and the really and truly only person in my entire life who unconditionally believed in my talent and never stepped back from facilitating me to have my talent come forward in the best, most effective way possible. I was with him for 20 years. The first 10 were good. And the last 10, he was fighting cancer. He hid it from me. As a matter of fact, I did, I saw a huge mood change in him. Um, and I could never figure it out. And one day we were living um, in Connecticut, near Kent, Connecticut, on the top of a mountain on 20 acres of pristine land. And it was a snowstorm of the century. And I was worried about him getting home because he was in a sport. We had a sports car and a four wheel drive. Okay. So, fax machine, this tells you how long ago this was, fax machine keeps ringing and i'm like who is trying to send a fax and don't they know how to do it and finally the fax comes through and it says mr james rush your condition is terminal basically there's no hope oh my god so now i'm in the middle of the snowstorm and where is he and how is he going to explain this and he came home and he didn't want me to know but the long story short was I was sole caregiver for almost 10 years. It receded and it came back again, and like a vengeance everywhere. And I remember towards the end, constantly bargaining with God and saying, take two years of my healthy life and give it to him. Please God, let him just have a, even a year where he's pain-free, worry-free, and can just live a life. Please, please, I would pray for that all the time when it didn't happen. So he was very angry towards the last few years, very, very bitter about being so sick. And, and that happens a lot. And you as a sick person, sort of take it out on the person closest to you, your mate. But it never dimmed my love for him. And it, 
I just took it as this is part of the drill. Um, he passed on and I was in such a deep state of grief. I still had to go on air. I went on air a lot with tears in my eyes. He made me promise I'd never miss a show on Tell Retail, and so I didn't. But he never came back to me. And I thought, was he blaming me for his death? How angry was he? Um, and I worried about him. When you when you pass on after being that sick for that long, even in the afterlife, you must be exhausted. And then one night, out of absolutely nowhere, I went to sleep and had what many psychics and mediums call a, a dream visitation. And most of what I've experienced with the afterlife, with the spiritual world, with the non-physical has been through dreams, where mediums will always tell you that you're more open to that when you're asleep. When you're awake, you can use your eyes and your ears and block it out and rationalize it away. Okay, so here's the dream. And it it's crazy. And you kind of know it's a dream within the dream because it's so illogical and physically impossible. And yet you in a dream like that, a visitation dream, you are literally living what you're dreaming and feeling it and, and feeling it emotionally as well. So in the dream, I just went to sleep, ordinary night, went to sleep. I'm in the Chrysler building in New York City where we lived together, Manhattan. And I come off an elevator and the elevator's packed with people. And there's so many people in the lobby. And you have to know the Chrysler building is iconic and it's so beautiful and all gilded inside and, and just spectacular. And I think, what? am I doing here? Do I work in the Chrysler building now? And I look outside and I see that the crowds are building. There's more and more flow of people. And there's a subway station just to the right of the Chrysler building on Lexington Avenue. And I can see and I lo logically think, oh, uh, work day must be done. It's rush hour. And I guess I'm going to figure out how to go home now. And I look up and Jim is walking by. But it isn't the sick Jim. It's the healthy Jim. It's the younger Jim. He just to step back. He passed on his 60th birthday. So um, I think, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, he's alive. Oh my God, I've got to get to him. Oh my God, I have so much to say to him. And I look down and I'm barefoot. Now that is totally absurd. Nobody in Manhattan is going to step out on a sidewalk with no shoes on. I go to the front, which has the circular pathway to get through. And I look outside and the sidewalk is paved in chunks of broken glass. And I think to myself, would you step on broken glass and shred your feet and be bleeding and in tons of pain to get to say goodbye to him one more time? And you know, it didn't even 
take a nanosecond for me to say yes. And I went through the door and I remember stepping on the glass and screaming, Jim, 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 I'm here. I'm here. Stop. And he just kept going and he was solid and not see-through, not ghost-like, but he was not of this world. You could tell that he wasn't Jim. He was partially Jim. He was physically Jim so that you had a recognition that it was him. But he never moved his mouth. He kind of floated to the first steps of the subway down underground. And I remember I was walking on the broken glass and shredding my feet and screaming, stop, stop. Let me tell you I love you. Please, please stop. Let's have one last time when we can talk. And he turned around and looked at me as if to say, I can't. I just can't. That's not my role anymore. And he walked down into the subway with huge rush hour crowd behind him. And I lost him. And um, I am going to tell you that dream was as real to me today, 26 years later, as it was the night I had it. That is a dream visitation. That's when someone truly has the strength or, or had that kind of psychic spiritual power within their lifetime to be able to muster that kind of energy to come back. And I remember that before he passed, we felt that we had lived many previous lives together. And I said, what am I going to do without you? You're everything to me. You're, you, you, you're my whole foundation of wisdom and how to live a pure, clean, ethical, moral, and, and happy and spiritually content life. And what am I going to do without you? And I remember him saying to me, Diane, we've had a million conversations. I've imparted as much wisdom as I have. And anytime you need me, just remember me. I'll be back. You'll get your answers. You don't need me anymore to live a fulfilling life. And it took years before I was able to truly write myself again. But he was right. I called him back so many times just in my brain and my memory. And he was always there for me. And so that's my story. And I've told it to a couple of people. One medium said, if only Sigmund Freud was alive, he would have had a lot to say about your dream, Diane. But I, I don't want it looked at that way. Um, I, for me, the interpretation of my dream visitation and my beloved soulmate coming back to me was, yeah, I would have walked on broken glass, shredded my feet up, been in incredible pain just to say one last time, I love you. Thank you so much for being in my life. And, um, Mary, I don't know how that sounds to you because your visitation was so much more physical and and so different. So I just ask you from your point of view, what does this, how does this affect you, my story? I definitely believe it. Um, whether, you know, you're awake to experience or whether you're dreaming any experience, I mean, doesn't matter how it happens it happens and it's just reassuring knowing 
that our loved ones do decide to come back to let them, you know, let us know that they are okay, that we can proceed with our lives and go on with a normal life. And, and you know, I just in talking about it publicly for the first time today, I realize that that whole experience of walking on broken glass is pretty much without shoes on, is pretty much what's it, what it is like taking care of somebody who has a terminal disease, because every day was a heartbreaker. Every day you were just praying that, that the cancer was going to recede, it was going to get better. And even after they told me in the hospital, because he was in ICU before he passed, but they let him out so he could be where he wanted to be by the ocean when he went on to the non-physical plane. Um, when they told me I couldn't wrap my brain around it, I could not wrap my brain around the fact that he would not be there anymore, that he wouldn't be in my life anymore. And, and I, like you, in many ways thought I should have done more to save him. I could have done more. I don't know what, but, and, I thought a lot about not going on. I thought a lot about what would this world be like without him in it. For me, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be something I wanted to participate in. But he was right to come back, as was your father. And I have to say that uh, 26 years later, and I, I always think about him during Thanksgiving because he died November 7th on his 60th birthday. Um, and so always Thanksgiving dinner reminds me of who's not sitting there rather than who is. Um, I, I, I'm living out some of the happiest years of my life now. So it's not easy when you lose somebody and it's not always so actionable when that person when you have the privilege of that person coming back to you and saying i'm okay you're okay you've got to go on but both you and i did and i think we're probably much more fulfilled and complete people today for having that experience and working through it I totally agree. So, I mean, it's not productive to live your life as a depressed person. I mean, you, to me, I put myself in the position saying, is this the way my father would want me to live out my life? Uh, and so that, that yeah. having that, you know, happen, that has definitely helped to allow me to live my life. Yeah, there are years where I don't really want to celebrate my birthday because of that. But then I have to remind myself when it does come to that. No, 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 no. This isn't how you, your dad would want you to be. So you just need to go on and continue living your life. And very interesting that it, it and, and obviously emotionally wrenching that it happened on your birthday. For Jim, he passed on his 60th birthday. And always this time of year when holiday season comes around, I get more subdued because I remember that. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your story. And I think the thing that was so incredible to me is your father had such a huge presence that other people witnessed him. Oh my God, I have literally never heard that before. And for me, it was just such a completely exceptional dream that I think you could hear in my voice. It still is so real to me, even today. So Mary, I thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you for listening to our stories. They are way beyond ghost stories. They are truly love and loss and regaining that person again kind of stories and um i wish for you that you will always be too young to be old thank you so much for listening to too young to be old podcast the episode may be over but the fun doesn't have to stop here find us on facebook instagram tiktok and youtube at the diane gilman or visit our website thedianegilman.com if you like the show 
leave us a rating or a review, and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And until then, don't forget, age is just a number. Together, we'll prove that we are all too young to be old. <laughs>